grab a roadie and your barber jacket because we're headed out of the swells. We know each other well enough by now, but please remember that adults who use adult language told me these terrifying tales. These ghost stories aren't for kids. Gotta hop in here really quick to apologize. You're gonna hear some footsteps, stomping, loud voices, maybe a couple barks in the background, and for sure at the end, you'll hear a couple of the dogs chewing on bones, which was preferable to that, that screech barking. So, I hope you still can enjoy the show. Stay tuned after the story for some blah 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 from me, but for now, we're on to Out of the Swells number 10, The Grey Ghost. When you think of the Queen Mary, if you think of the Queen Mary, you probably think of its history. The flouncy fabulousness of its original purpose as a luxury liner catering to the rich. Or perhaps you think of its role as a warship in World War II and the bloodshed it both witnessed and caused. Maybe you think of its present, docked at the port of Long Beach, California, or maybe the Queen Mary brings death to mind. Wouldn't be surprising. There have been multiple deaths recorded on board the Queen Mary since its launch in 1936. You can find countless websites with all the lurid details of the Queen Mary's tragic past. I found the following on top10s.net. At least 49 people have died on the ship since it served as a luxury cruise liner along with countless other military personnel who passed away during the war. One report was that of a man who was crushed to death in the engine room. Nicknamed Half-Hatch Harry, the 18-year-old crewman crushed to death by door number 13 is said to haunt Shaft Alley. Just think about that for a second. The story goes he and his fellow crewmates were screwing around, jumping back and forth in front of the door as it closed, and he got caught and crushed as it sealed shut. It's not just his death that must haunt that space, but all the consciences of those who saw it happen. Those men who jumped in time just before he did. The guy who pulled the lever to begin the closing. The one who leapt right before him. The men who had to collect his remains. The doctor who declared him dead. All of those feelings have got to leave a mark, too. Several children are said to have passed away by drowning in the pool. There have been documented murders that took place aboard the Queen Mary years ago, too. There's so much more. And it all adds up to the great ship's reputation as one of the most haunted places in America. Now, layer on the fact that it's also a hotel and tourist attraction. If you want, you can stay the night in one of its 347 original staterooms and suites. Personally, I would not stay in Suite B340. In all honesty, I wouldn't stay in any of the rooms, but there have been so many complaints of paranormal activity in this specific room that it became off-limits to guests for a time. It was the usual ghosty stuff. Faucets turning on and off on their own, and the toilet flushing by itself, too. There were footsteps and that old feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. But after receiving so many requests to stay in that room, they decided to reopen it to guests. For just $499 a night, you may experience the haunting for yourself. The ship will even provide you with some ghost hunting equipment, a Ouija board, crystal ball, and tarot cards. That ship is chock full of ghosts. Too many to detail here without taking up a ton of time, but perhaps that's why one of them followed today's interviewee home. Maybe things were getting a little too cramped on board, and they jumped ship. Gunner Dark Knight obviously not his real name, though he did request that I use this as his alias, has been ghost hunting for years, methodically checking infamous haunted locations off his bucket list one vacation at a time. He slept in Lizzie Borden's bedroom, not once, but four times. Oh, she did it all right, and I would have done the same. That dad was one sick bastard. He used to say that Bobby Mackey's music world was the scariest location he'd ever visited. Though, he now claims that his own home is the worst haunt he's ever experienced. But at Bobby Mackey's, it was the dark shadow figures that had him so shook. There's no doubt in my mind that there's something demonic at that bar, and it has nothing to do with Pearl Bryan's murder, if that ever happened. I'm certain the whole beheading nonsense was just that. Nonsense, but 
The place used to be a slaughterhouse, and the actual suicide of that girl Johanna may have thrown fuel on the fire, but it's the hunters who've stirred the pot since then that keep the place active. Either willingly or unwittingly, somebody opened a door to a really bad place there. I was alone at that well, and this darkness just wrapped itself around me. Up until that point in my life, I'd never felt such dread. It's pure evil. His favorite haunted hotspot is Savannah, Georgia. The ghosts there are just fun. It's like they know what's up. They're there to haunt, and we're there to get the chills, and they don't disappoint. I got to hang in the pirate's house basement for a few hours by myself, and the EVPs were off the charts. I had to look that one up. According to VisitSavannah.com, a saloon and rest stop for seafarers from abroad, the pirate's house still stands today as one of Savannah's most well-known restaurants. However, the pirate's house can't escape its dark past. Many were brutishly shanghaied down in the boarding house basement and forced to serve on the sea. But you want to hear about the ship, Gunner said, his voice growing grim. A charmingly large guy, like an ex-football player put out to pasture, Gunner falls somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. A scruffy-bearded, retired police officer who proudly refers to himself now as a house husband, who just so happens to be married to my hairdresser. I asked him why so many people in law enforcement get into investigating the paranormal. It's a thing I've noticed over the years on my beloved ghost hunting shows. We're people who like answers, he replied without missing a beat. And I bet you can't find one cop who hasn't run into something totally unexplainable on the job. Paramedics and firefighters, too. We just have exposure to too many people, too many places. Sooner or later, something happens that you can't explain, and I think it lights a fire in a lot of us. Hmm, that makes a lot of sense, I said. What about you? Why are you into this stuff? I hadn't shared with his wife that I could see spirits, and since everything around us was spirit-free for the time being, I didn't feel the need to tell him either. So I said, you know, to start out, I don't really know how I became so obsessed with the paranormal. I just always have been. The only thing that can explain it is that the spookier it is, the more calming it is for me, if that makes any sense. I can't tolerate watching any sort of drama on TV. It's too uncomfortable. I'll be up all night with the worries, but show me a horror movie and I'll doze off like a baby. Gunner laughed at the idea. I totally get that. I'm happiest traipsing through an old, abandoned, insane asylum at midnight with one of my buddies. Are you an anxious person? I asked. Uh, yeah, you might say that. Yeah, I've been reading about how some people's baseline gets set high in childhood, and because of it, they need to seek out highly charged situations to feel normal. That tracks, he said with a grin. How about you? Are you a warrior? I held up my hands, showing off my bitten nails. He threw his head back in laughter and held up his own bitten fingers. Twinsies, I laughed. I suppose so. Not many people I know get the draw to go stunning. It's always nice to meet someone who's into it, too. Jane's a good sport, said Gunner. She'll travel wherever I want to go, but she's in the spa and to bed by nine when we're in a hot spot. Earplugs in, I'm asked firmly in place. Yeah, she mentioned she didn't want to see anything she couldn't unsee, I replied, smiling. Sure, sure, Gunner said, his face falling. There are times when I wish I'd taken a page out of her book. Like on the ship. Yes. Do you know much about it? Well, I've watched the Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters, Holter Files, and the BuzzFeed Unsolved Investigations about it, and listened to a handful of podcastings about the hauntings. Just to chat with me? No, no, I just love this stuff. You really do. That saves me some explaining. He squinted his eyes for a moment, as if my admission had solidified something. It was a birthday present from Jane, given on the condition that she didn't have to tag along. She visited her sister in Santa Monica while I spent the weekend on the boat. We planned the trip around the first date Sweet B340 was available. I got a reservation for November 2019, right before COVID. Good and bad luck, depending on how you look at it. You stayed there alone? Oh, yeah, and it didn't disappoint. 
I searched that room top to bottom for any funny business. You know, little tricks to thrill the guests. And I gotta say, that place was clean. Just as I was dozing off that first night, the faucet in the bathroom turned on full blast. Startled the hell out of me. I read about that happening in the room, and I skimmed past it. Not really clocking it as anything too spooky, but it really got me. I checked beneath the sink to make sure they hadn't rigged it up to go off, but I didn't find anything that would indicate a setup. Sounds like you were pretty skeptical. More like suspicious. That place makes a lot of money from its reputation. I could understand if the owners might be tempted to boost the hit ratio for ghost hunters. You know, from what I could tell, the place was legit. Well, I had two nights to do the whole horse and pony. Most unsettling feelings came up near door 13, where that poor man was crushed to death. It's true that you get more in tune to vibes the more haunted places you go, and the vibes in there were bad. Not evil, just bad, bad feelings. Loss, disbelief, that sort of thing. The story about the POWs being held in the hull of the ship was new to me. I hadn't heard about that until I took the tour. Talk about torture. I'm sure there are worse ways to go, but being cooked to death ain't something I'd wish on my worst enemy. Nasty EVPs down there. The kind that make you hope the whole residual haunting thing is real. That's just energy causing disturbance rather than people getting trapped in their very worst moments, not realizing they're dead, that it's over. It's awful to think about, I said, not wanting to tell him that was exactly what happens to some poor souls. All of that was spooky, but it was the pool area that got me into deep water, so to speak. Jackie, I guessed. Bingo. One of the most famous ghosts on the Queen Mary is Jacqueline Torrin, a little girl who was around five or six years old when she tragically drowned in the second-class pool. There are many reports of a little girl splashing in the water, though there's no actual water in the pool now, and calling out for her parents. She's even said to play hide-and-seek with guests. Some people believe that Jackie had a friend named Sarah who also drowned in that exact same pool in 1949. Several people have heard the girls singing. A spook fest, for sure, and a sad one at that. But you all know my stance on little girl ghosts. They're never really little girl ghosts. I know people will swear up and down that there are child spirits who interact with the living in these haunting places. Maybe I haven't been to that ship myself, but I would bet a million dollars that Jackie, and around her name I put air quotes, isn't the ghost of a little girl. If it were, then why the hell hasn't anyone ever tried to move her on? No, she's a distraction. A temptation to look into deep darkness. Just ask Gunner. I saved the pool deck for my second night on the boat because I wanted to really devote a lot of time to it. I got lucky, and there was a small group, only three other people. We were all taking turns asking questions. The first hour was pretty quiet. One of the women had brought toys with her, a ball and a teddy bear, and she was pretty focused on getting Jackie or Sarah to move one of them. At one point, one of our tour guides came down to hang with us. Actually, what she said was she wanted to check to make sure we were all okay. There'd been some incidents in recent weeks, and if the negative encounters continued, the staff were considering closing the pool area to investigators until they were certain things were safe. Ooh, did she say what was going on? I tried to pry the details out of her, but she was squirrely. Huh. I pressed her, though, asking if we should be on the lookout for anything. Watch the tone of the EVPs, she advised, and be sure to do a cleansing when you step off the ship. Now, I never put much weight on the idea of personal spiritual cleansing, or even of doing the whole protection ritual before going into a haunted environment. After all, I want to experience ghosts. Why would I protect myself? And a cleansing after the fact? Why would any ghost want to come home with me? But the specificity of her suggestion that the second we leave the boat, we should do a cleansing ritual, that made me think. Kind of ominous, I agreed. Uh, she wouldn't provide any further details, and I found that frustrating, but I let it go. She hung with us for a time, then went on her way. After she did, one of the guys there was like, anyone up for shaking things up a bit? Sounds like there might be more than just Jackie down here. The guy he was there was suggested we do some provoking to see if we could shake something loose. I told him I'd pass, but they could go for it. 
At that point, the woman who'd been there bowed out too. I think our tour guide's warning freaked her out. The one guy, I'll call him Baseball Hat, the other one Tattoos. I didn't catch their names, so Baseball Hat starts provoking right out of the meathead playbook. Didn't have an original thought in his head. So I just hung back and observed. I will say that even if he was a cheeseball, the guy did manage to turn the vibe. It got real spooky real fast. He played back his recordings and got a couple of strange EVPs. One was of this weird popping sound that none of us had heard in real time, and the other was whispering. A whispered conversation, actually. None of us could make out the words, but there were definitely two people, or spirits, talking to one another. The guys took off after another hour or so. I went with them to use the facilities, then decided to give the pool another shot. When I went back down there, I was pretty fired up to find the place empty. I jumped right into an EVP session. Actually, here. He picked up his phone off the table and opened his recording app. You have headphones? Yeah, but do I want to listen to this? He pursed his lips and tilted his head to the side. It's not the clearest recording I've captured, but it's the weirdest. I reached into my coat pocket and unwound my headphones from around my phone and let Gunner plug them into his phone. He pressed play. A little louder, I instructed. That good? Yeah, better. I listened to Gunner speak into the silence. He introduced himself. He asked if there were any spirits who would like to speak with him. He said, Jackie, if you really are here, you don't have to stay, honey. You can move on. I met his eyes as I listened and smiled. Then there was a silence and a strange noise, a sort of hiss, then a pop. I said, did you hear that when you were recording this? He shook his head. Keep listening. I'd like to speak to the spirit causing concern. It sounds like you're new around here. Why are you here? His questions were followed by more silence. It's getting colder in here. Is that you? Are you making it cold in here? A response in the form of nonsensical mumbling came through. I met Gunner's eyes again. His face was grim. There is a loud metallic bang on the recording. Are you trying to intimidate me? Gunner's voice demanded. You're going to have to do more than that. More mumbling than one word ask. It was clear as day. Give me a sign of your presence. Distant tapping. Gunner fell silent on the recording, and then there was a glitchy kind of static, and I heard him grunt. Then the recording ended. I pulled out my earbuds. What was that? One thing I know I'm freezing my ass off asking questions into the darkness. The next thing I know I'm flat on my back looking up at a couple women asking me if I'm okay. Oh, no. I blacked out. I have the sense something rushed me, but I don't really have memory of it. Not good. No. I feel like a lot of amateur ghost hunters go to places like that and don't really experience anything at all, but you seem to have experienced a lot. Oh, yeah. Have you ever thought you might have abilities? Sure as hell hope not, he said emphatically. Visiting haunted locations is one thing, but who in their right mind would want to see and hear ghosts all day? I smiled. But you did see and hear them for a time, right? Yeah, until I called in the big guns and cleared them out of my house for good. So what followed you home? Gunner fiddled with his empty coffee cup. Something really, really nasty. I should have taken that guide's advice and done some sort of spiritual cleansing when I got off that ship. I was too stubborn, he muttered. Well, when did you know you had a problem? On the plane ride home. Uh-uh. To be frank, I had a creepy feeling ever since I left that pool deck. I chalked it up to visiting a good haunt, but even my wife noticed I was jumpy. For one thing, I couldn't sleep. We had two nights in L.A. before we headed back east, and I tossed and turned both nights. The second I'd start to drift off, I'd startle awake, thinking I'd heard something, or that I'd felt someone shake me. Finally dozed off on the plane for about an hour, and my wife said I was mumbling the whole time. She didn't want to wake me, wanted to let me get some sleep after all those nights of tossing and turning. 
What were you saying in your sleep? I was apologizing over and over again. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I scrunched my nose. Not good. Not good, he agreed. And it got much worse. First night at home, we go to bed and I crashed. It was such a relief until I woke up across the street in our neighbor's yard. The guy was yelling my name for a full minute. He was about to have his husband call the police. Embarrassed doesn't begin to describe what it felt like. There I was in these guys' yard like an oaf just wandering around in my tidy whities I couldn't help but laugh. Quite an image, huh? They'll never let me forget it either, Gunnar guffawed. Every time they see Jane now, they ask if she's keeping a close eye on me. Well, that felt like a fluke. Uh, no, it didn't, but I did my damnedest to chalk it up to one. Jane made me a doctor's appointment. They took blood work, and I ended up on a low-sodium diet, which sucked. But the doc diagnosed the sleep stuff as stress-related. And, you know, Jane made me start taking walks with her in the morning. At that point, the feeling of being watched was with me all the time. Then, a couple of weeks after we got home, I was in my office working on a puzzle when I heard the hiss and pop. Same one from the EVP session. I'll tell you what, it stopped me cold. I froze up. Couldn't even move, though I would have sworn on a Bible that there was someone standing right behind me. I mean, I just knew it. After a second or two, someone tapped on the window beside me, and I spun around, but of course there was nothing there. I got up and checked outside to make sure, but all was clear. Eventually, I grabbed another tea and sat back down to my puzzle to try and cool down. The blood pressure was definitely up. God, you know, I was probably sitting there for at least five, ten minutes before I felt the tug on my pant leg. Oh, no. Yeah, she was under my desk, crouched down, her hand over her mouth like she was trying not to laugh out loud. A little girl? Sure looked like a little girl, but that thing didn't have an ounce of human in it. I both could and couldn't believe my eyes. It was like my brain couldn't catch up. We just stared at each other, and then she started to crawl out from under the desk. But she wasn't using her hands to crawl. Gunner shook his head at the memory. She sort of wrapped her hands around her neck and crawled out on her elbows and feet. What the fuck? Yeah, that got me moving. The wife and I stayed at the residence inn over in Needham that night. Now, I know better than to think that that evil bastard was going to stay in my house. I knew damn well it was connected to me, but I just felt I could keep a better eye on a hotel room than a whole house. That makes sense. Yeah, I went sleepwalking again that night. In the hotel? Yeah. The poor night manager found me apologizing to thin air on their pool deck. He let out a sigh. Like a stubborn idiot, I waited too long to reach out for help. It's not like I didn't know what I should do. I just didn't want to admit that I needed it. Through the ghost hunting network, I knew this demonologist guy, and I reached out to him the next morning. Someone local? Yeah, actually, he lives here in town. Nick. Nick Sayer. I sucked in a breath. I take it you know him. Mm-hmm. Didn't know he'd become a demonologist, though. Well, that's what he calls himself. He wasn't much help, truth be told. Came to the house and wanted to investigate. Caught a good EVP, though. What did it say? You asked for this. I let out a low whistle. Guessing maybe that's why I was apologizing so much in my sleep. My story's fair warning to all those ghost hunters out there. You ask one of these to show you a sign of their presence... You better be specific unless you want them coming up with their own answer for you. Long story short, that Nick guy put me in touch with a woman named Biddy who had some connections with the church. Stop it. You know her? She's one of my closest friends. How have we not met each other yet? Huh, small world. Just one smart lady. Doesn't mess around either. I gave her the lay of the land and was ready to go through the whole dog and pony with the Catholics, but... She thought I should try a Wiccan priestess first. Cool. Did it work? Like a charm. Haven't seen hide nor tail of that nasty thing since. Well, there's absolutely nothing around you right now, that's for sure. Oh, really? How can you tell? Um, 
I hedged, realizing that I'd put my foot in my mouth. Are you psychic? No, nothing like that. Then what? Promise you won't think I'm crazy. Depends on what you say next. I took a deep breath. I'm a medium, and not only are there no spirits around you, this entire coffee shop is empty. It's weird. Gunnar sat back in his seat, and his face lit up with a huge smile. Well, I can explain that, he said, pulling a necklace from beneath his shirt. At the end of the silver chain was a teeny tiny bottle. A teeny tinier cork stopper on top of it held a red powder securely inside. Brick dust, I said in realization. He laughed. Yep, I guess that's confirmation this stuff really works. It sure does. It even kept my guide away. He tucked the necklace back into his shirt. No more ghost hunting for me. I'm sorry, I replied. Eh, you're never too old to try something new, he said, waving the comment away. Now aliens, aliens are a whole other ball game. The dogs are going nuts right now, and there's people stomping around upstairs, so yeesh, you'll probably hear them. But I wanted to say that I am ever so grateful to all of you who have supported the show financially over the years. For the near future, though, I've decided to pause the coffee page. There are too many places that need financial support more than I do right now. I've listed five of my favorites on the support page at ghostsintheburbs.com if you got money to burn. However, if you enjoyed this episode or the ones before it, please consider leaving a five-star review. It is one of the best ways to support the podcast. Another way is to follow me on Instagram, where I post the most up-to-date info on what's to come. We podcasters ask for these things because these statistics really matter. I don't mess with ads anymore because I think they kill our vibe. So I don't need those stats for advertisers. But for instance, if say a publisher was considering taking on my book, or how about perhaps someone at some point was looking to develop this podcast into a TV show? We can keep our fingers crossed, but said people might want to see Ghosts in the Burbs' strong listenership reflected in its social media numbers. You just never know about these things. So if you get a moment, give the show five stars and smash that follow button on Insta. And after you do, tell a friend. I've got a good classic haunt to share next time, and I've got some great interviews up my sleeve. I'm even toying with sharing a haunted house meets an apocalyptic future novella with you a few chapters at a time in the near future. It all depends on if I can get my act together. But for now, this has been Out of the Swells. Good night, sleep tight, and don't forget your nightlight.